He is Stephen Ellis, our prospects analyst and associate editor at Daily Faceoff, fresh off of his trip to Switzerland at the U18 World Championships. Stephen, when you take a look at uh, your mock draft now, as you know, pretty easy to pencil in Connor Bedard and Adam Fantilli in the number one and two spots. But now that we know the order, take us through the rest of your top five and what that looks like in your mock draft. Well, first off, Frank, your story that you published this morning was awesome, getting the, the nice look at the, the draft lottery. But, uh, yeah, you look at Bedard, number one, that's easy. Number two, Fantilli, great prospect. Got to talk to him yesterday for a feature that's coming up. Um, for number three, I'm going with Leo Carlson on, on the Blue Jackets. I think, you know, it, just the way he plays is just so smart. He's very good in front of the net. He's very defensively responsible. And I just like the idea of him and Gujo and maybe Line A or, or Marchenko playing together. I just think that he fills just so many of the, the deficiencies that team's missing down the middle and you know if Cujo in particular you sign him for a long-term deal you want him to be able to play with some quality talent and uh, I think that that'll be something where uh, that's the guy they get uh, the big question for me though was where you're going to put Mitchkoff and I was thinking number four but then I ended up deciding you know Will Smith is a guy that can really turn things around in San Jose he will be going to college next year so it's not an immediate thing and I think that from there he'll he'll learn to play a bit better defensively, uh, add a bit more muscle to his game, but the creativity is there. And the one prospect, a lot of scouts, and more than I was expecting, we're talking about at the U18s, was Ryan Leonard. And you know, at first I'm thinking maybe later in the top five or later in the top ten, but you know, the more I'm talking to, they're like Montreal seems like a good fit where he can go in there. He'll be a fan favorite. He's the guy that when I asked like scouts like describe him it was like the guy that will help you win games it's he will always fight for you he will always put his best effort out there you know he he missed some games this year but he still had over 50 points just under 100 games and was kind of the driving force in a lot of cases for that top line for the u.s national development team so when i'm looking at the top five you know that's a quality group right there well, Stephen, I, I really do agree with you, especially on four and five, because the connections with Smith going to BC, Leonard going to BC, you've got Mike Greer, who's a Boston guy, you've got Marty St. Louis and Jeff Gordon, they're both Connecticut based in that New England area before they went off to Montreal. So I, I definitely like where your head's at on those. But I think Mitchkoff being outside the top five, it, it's really interesting to me. And uh, Arizona, Frank mentioned, kind of played themselves out of those top couple of picks, but you have uh, AZ taking them at six. And, you know, I'm just curious, why, why is the risk worth it for them? Because in my opinion, the reason he falls to six is because there is some risk involved. There's a lot of risk. And, you know, this is one that just talking to people in, in Switzerland, I was trying to get a clear answer. Like, what's going to happen? And no one seems to know. It seems like a lot of teams are trying to psych each other out in terms of information on whether or not they'll pick him. So, you know, the long-term contract is definitely a, a, an issue there where he signed till 2026. There's other things and, you know, it's just kind of sifting, but what's real, what's not. And when it comes to with Arizona, you know, I'm looking at this as a long-term situation for them. I know the Coyotes have kind of, it almost feels like they're rebuilding every year, but, you know, I, the, the, the rumor of potentially Logan Cooley going back to college for next year and the, the team where, you know, they got some good prospects, but they're not going to be ready and I'm thinking like with Mitchkoff would come in with that new arena well, that would be a really cool addition to be the big star that really gets everything going there in Arizona in a couple of years but you know at the same time it wouldn't surprise me if he goes a little earlier but the, I think that the issue here is just you know the unknowns and uh, what he was able to do in the KHL this season was spectacular you know putting up some great numbers with Sochi um, I, I believe he is going to be going back to discuss St. Petersburg after or to start the season but you know just the talent there is going to be great Great. It's just, is a team going to be willing to to wait? And I think a team like Arizona, would they all have to be looking long-term here? I think they'd be one that's willing to take that move there. Yeah, there's such fascination around where Madve Mishkov ends up going, Stephen. Um, and as we take a look at your mock draft order again, there's so many different risers and fallers. We had Craig Button on the DFO rundown last week, and he was talking about Axel Sandin Pelica and another guy that doesn't even show up in your top 16, uh, Tom Willander. He's thinking those two guys, the Swedish defensemen, might be the two best D-men in this draft. Um, so when you take a look at the top 16 that you have here, you've sort of got Bedard in his own class, 
And then how would you tear out these next 16 picks or next 15 picks after that and break those down into groups in terms of quality of player? Because you heard Yarmo Kekalainen say, we're going to get a franchise type cornerstone player at number three. See, it's tough because I don't have him obviously in my in my top five, but I think Mitch Goff, there's a potential for him to be the second best player in this draft. But I think just, you know, from a, from a, actual selection standpoint i don't think he'll go that high um for me it's bedard number one i think you could throw fantilli and, and mitchkoff into another tier uh maybe carlson and smith and 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 leonard and into a point maybe benson from there um the defense is i think the toughest one here because i don't think we got a, a true number one defenseman here but the one that i think just impressed me the most was david reinbacher and i think you know um, some Flyers fans were asking, like, would, would they really pick him? It's like, you got to go for the best available player. And I think, you know, for me, Reinbacher has to be one of the guys that uh, will go early. I just the, the skill he showed in the top Swiss League this year is something we don't often see from a defenseman of that age. And that, that's really important. Um, I'd be putting him in a, a pool maybe there of Oliver Moore, Dalibor Dvorsky, and, and Sandy and Pelica. And then kind of after that, that's when you got the question marks of, you know, like, I love Gabe Perot. I like Kobe Barlow. I like Edward Shala, but are those guys, you know, are they all there? Are they, do they have the skill to make it work in the NHL and be a super effective player? So I think kind of like after about 11, that's where things fall off a little bit. Uh, I think your uh, internet cut out there, Stephen. Uh, Stephen, pleased to uh, have you join us today for the next wave, which was presented by our friends at Boston Pizza and their new fan analytics menu. No better place on the planet to watch all of the Stanley Cup playoff action than at Boston Pizza. Thanks, Stephen. Talk to you next week. Thanks, guys.